Welcome back, folks, to the Mail Rights Show. This is episode 383. It's me, Jonathan Denwood, and my co-host, Robert Newman. Um, I'm doing the lead this week. We're going to be discussing a great subject that Robert did a great video on, the death of traditional real estate branding. It's a great subject. It was a great video. It's going to be a great discussion. Before we go into the meat and potatoes of it, let me introduce my great co-host, Robert. Robert, would you like to introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers? I'd love to. So my name is Robert Newman. I am the founder of Inbound Real Estate Marketing, uh, better known as Inbound REM. I talk about um, real estate marketing, SEO, inbound marketing, and real estate lead generation, as well as uh, have a company that builds uh, kind of like done for you marketing campaign in those categories. Over to you, John. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Rob. And I'm the joint founder of Mail Hyphen Right. You you get the power of real geeks with the flexibility and branding power of WordPress with Mail Right. So go over there, have a look at what we got to offer, and book a demo. I'm sure you're going to be blown away. So, Robert, the death of traditional real estate branding. So maybe you can give us a quick synopsis of what you, this um, video that you did recently and some of your key thoughts around the subject. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I added this excitement, you know, the, the really like sizzly kind of title to it because, you know, it, a day doesn't go by, and you know this, John, where a realtor doesn't call in and talk about branding. And then when you when they start talking about branding, they talk talk about like a traditional brand identity package. For those of you listening to the show that may not know what that is, that's the letterhead, business cards, uh, maybe throwing a sign on your car, license plate, basically things that barely even move the needle in the digital age, things that are almost practically irrelevant and were almost entirely irrelevant during the pandemic. Because who is out there handing out business cards? Who is out there handing out letterhead? Who is out there doing any of that, right? So it got me to thinking that real estate branding has changed. And it hasn't changed a little bit. It has changed 100 degrees. What people believe branding to be and what it actually is are two different things, in my opinion. Okay. Do you, do you, now you already know, you've read the cliff notes, but, but so I'm going to ask you a loaded question here, John. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, or I think I do. Um, there might be a slight disagreement on the fringes, but the fundamental synopsis which you're trying to outline is, it is, but it is tricky because some traditional marketing mythologies still really work very effectively in real estate where others um, like business cards I still have some and I still hand them out at local events it's more habit than anything um, a lot of younger entrepreneur business owners don't have them at all so it it's it's a kind of tricky kind of strange era that we're in isn't it really in some ways very much so. And and so to, to go to your point about business cards, the only people that I've, I've met or talked to recently are doing digital business cards, this metal card that you slap up against your phone and automatically downloads your information into somebody's contact list. That's what I've seen. I haven't even seen traditional business cards. I have f like 250 that I printed out when I started Inbound REM, of which I've got about 50 left, and honest to God, I think I've mostly lost the remaining 200. I don't think I ha I think I may have handed out 25 business cards in seven years. So, yeah. but that's that's not true necessarily of a of a salesperson selling real estate. But before we dive into that, I'm just going to give everybody the bu bullet points, okay? Because I did this on a board where everybody could see it. And I want to do the same thing in our podcast. So for those of you listening, here's the five points that I think mostly comprise branding in 
today's age, in the 2020s of the modern real estate marketing era. Social proof, which to me is more important than than um, visually based branding elements. Okay, social proof is reviews, what people have to say about you, what cl past clients have to say, and basically sold homes. Knowledge is more important than glad handing or charisma. Proof more important than um, uh well, proof is just more important than than uh, word of mouth or buzz these days. Okay, so that used to be the way it used to work, but I'm going to get into that a little bit. And personal brand, personal brand, this is one of the huge ones. I have watched in real estate specifically, big brands have lost almost all of their cachet. There are a few exceptions and uh, in specific markets. But most of the time, per, like big brands have almost no authority anymore and, or, and they don't move the needle in how people choose their vendors. And last, and this is one of my favorites because nobody ever knows what I'm talking about. Mission is more important than mandate. All right. Now to go back to the beginning, John, social proof. Okay. When I talk to people about how they're making decisions, and and I talk to, I am still doing two or three sales calls a day with actual real estate agents. And I've been doing that for 14 years. And one of the things that really seems to have changed is that my dad, everybody I know who's buying a home, everybody who's buying anything, they seem to check out reviews. So my first question before I even ask you what you think, when you go out and make a decision about, let's just say you're going to spend more than $100, more maybe more than 200 on something. Do you, and you're looking at a local ser service provider, whether that be a mechanic or a restaurant you're going to go eat at, you're going to take somebody out on a date, whatever it is, Jim, you're going to sign up for, do you read reviews? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. It, the, it depends on the amount of money, obviously. Um, the more, the more the ticket price of the purchase, the probably the more, research I do on that front, basically. Okay. So you look at social proof. When you read reviews, does it make a difference to your end decision? <sighs> That's, well, obviously, if there's a lot of bad reviews and they seem to be reasonably sane people, as a service... As, been that both of us are service providers in the business to business sector. I'm not being flippant here. There are a minority of people that are unpleasable. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever you do, they will find some fault in it. And there's a very small minority that I even question their sanity. <laughs> uh, um, um, so we've all been there, um, but you know, um, but if the um, reviews or the bad reviews are there's a consistent pattern, and they seem reasonable people, yes, it would influence me. Okay, you're not alone. When I talk to people buying and selling real estate, when I talk to realtors buying and selling real estate, when I've designed my marketing campaigns, the clothes that I have, John, is mostly on the about page where we install social proof. These days, when we, when we talk to a realtor who's doing a lot of business out of a specific neighborhood or building, we make sure to get that sold home data on the page, uh, on, on the web page to show, to, to start to demonstrate their expertise. And we find that it makes a very big difference in the performance of the page and registrations on the page and things of that nature. So I believe that social proof is more important than what we used to acknowledge as branding. Like the proof is in the pudding. And I believe personally and I feel like I have a lot of data to point in the direction. Now, what do you think, though? Because you're saying, I feel like you're saying 
I kind of agree, but with qualifiers. Well, it's just it's just that a lot of reviews aren't aren't really legitimate, are they? You know, um, depending, you know, different platforms utilize technology to stop stop orchestrated reviews. Um, you know, like Yelp. You know, in some ways, Yelp's policies are quite annoying when it comes to your ability to leave a review. But in some ways, you understand why their platform has um, got some loops that you've got to jump through. So um, do Google to some extent, a lot of these platforms, because um, a lot of these reviews are, are kind of semi-orchestrated, aren't they? Uh, very much so. Now, 20 years ago, for those of you who are listening to the show who've been around that long, Century 21 was a dominant player because they had all these people in gold jackets that were on TV and all those... Do you think were, I should get a gold jacket, Robert? I definitely think you should not, John. Right, I do you. not think that either you or I are 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 fitted out for the old style of branding do you remember back in the day like ibm had uniforms nobody remembers this anymore but they did ibm had uniforms century 21 had uniforms the big way to establish brand was to get all your people like soldiers running around in the, in in similar clothing and selling your service and you did national advertising campaigns on radio and tv and newspapers and that was the way that people used to do branding that's what a lot of realtors still think that branding is. And I'm saying branding doesn't work that way anymore. No. These days that branding is much more about informational intelligence. In other words, how can we prove that you, John, are an expert in your category of business that you say you're good at? Like, let's just say that you do do a TV ad. The, it's no longer enough that you have an ad. You will not get conversions off that ad. You will get traffic back to a destination. That's what you'll get. You will not get your phone ringing. And I've done a lot of TV advertising when I used to work for Girls Gone Wild. We did about $7 million a month, and that made our phones ring off the hook. Wow. It was other things, though, that actually got people to sign up for continuity programs. So I speak from a relative level, like, level of experience in this category. Knowledge is the new branding. That's what this whole video is about. Like, like the, it's basically how do you prove that you know what you're talking about? Social proof is certainly one way. Video is another way, which we talk, you and I, seem yeah. to talk about almost every show at this point. It does, like, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's another way. Like demonstrating through video that you know what you're talking about. Now, we, and, and you know how you do that. You just put a video on a web page and start talking about what you're good at doing, okay? That will come across as more authoritative than a newspaper article that somebody else has written about you. Now, that is a huge, massive change. I'm not saying that a newspaper article that somebody's written about you is a bad way to advertise yourself at all. It's a good way to advertise yourself. But it isn't necessarily going to get you the same amount of calls that it used to. It's not enough to get somebody to pick up the phone. What I'm suggesting here, John, is that what it would be enough to do is send somebody to a website or a Google My Business page or a Zillow profile and open up somebody's mind to the idea that they're going to research you. And they, they might read your bio and they might look at your you know, like your reviews, and then they might also look at your past sales. And if all those things were in line, they would then call you. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think you're spot on. You know, I um, it's the kind of buyer's journey. You know, people um, pre-qualify themselves to a much higher extent than they used to. Um, I wouldn't say it's totally, but um, depending on the price point, um, they do do a lot more pre-research and pre-qualify the vendor that they're going to approach than they used to. And that process has only got more and more evident. Um, and I think COVID even 
increased that, didn't it? Because people just couldn't, weren't out there. They were at home and they were looking online, weren't they? Yes, definitely. Now, everything that I've said to you, like if all of you have followed our shows so far, I haven't said anything new. Okay, we've said this a few different times. Now, the last thing, the closer to this subject, is something that uh, a long-ass time ago, like two years ago, a couple of other branding gurus came on the show and they surprised me. And it, 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 I think, John, that I voted them to being like one of my top 10 shows when you and I were doing like top 10 podcasts. It was like this this man and woman who were not husband and wife, but they were really witty and sharp and they were they were branding experts. And they're the only other people that's ever mentioned this last line item in connection to brand. Okay. The mission is more critical than mandate. This is your extra credit. This is what everybody should be tuning into the show for. This is the gem in the content that we're, that we're providing the thing that will really move the needle that not that many people have talked to you about. And that is okay. So John, let's pretend that you have a hundred great reviews online about you. Let's pretend that you've got a pipeline, a way to drive people into those reviews. Like people are looking at them, so on and so forth. You've got somehow they're reading them. You're ranking organically. You're driving them in through paid advertising, word of mouth, one way or the other, they're arriving there. So all of that's in place. But the person doing the reading has a friend, a brother, an aunt, an uncle, a sister who is in the same business as the one that they're reviewing. They're just kind of trying to be polite and do their due diligence. They're saying to themselves, well, I'm about ready to spend ten dollars or $12,000. I should probably look around and make sure I'm finding somebody good. And they look and they go, okay, this is great reviews. The pricing is a little high, but you know, about in line with what my, my cousin's is. Now, in that circumstance between those two people, I, I would submit that most likely the cousin's still going to get the business. But there is a way for you to tip the the tip the scales in your favor and that is the following it is something that um gary van vaynerchuk talks about a lot and does incredibly well your personal mission who you are as a human being and what you believe in when, 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 if you're thinking that this is the only thing that's going to really move the needle or sell you a hundred homes, I would, I would be the first to say, no, probably not. But if you are in a very competitive market with a lot of other people doing a lot of what you're doing and a lot of other really qualified professionals coming up against you, which happens a lot in the luxury space and to some degree in the upper middle class space as well, then what sets you, like what makes everybody different? Well, at that point, it comes down to do you have a mission or something relatable to these people? That's what really can create a difference, such as uh, Christoph Chu's mission is he sleeps on the streets with homeless uh, people once a year, every year, does a huge drive about it, posts the content all over his sites. He has his dogs. He has his favorite uh, uh, like luxury kind of causes that he that he supports and he's extremely <laughs> vocal about all of them joyce ray has her set also so does jade mills she supports the arts christoph does the homeless thing and guess what i know from talking to all three of these people or well, actually not joyce ray i have not heard directly that they end up doing business with people that also support the arts that also believe that there's a homeless crisis in LA. It's not coincidental, John. I think that all things being equal, when you measure two incredibly competent professionals who both have great reviews and you're looking for something that may be the deciding factor, I think it's mission is going to be more important. And mandate, the mission more important, critical than mandate is what is the corporate mandate? The corporate mandate from Colwell Banker is like their tagline and things like that. And to be honest, I think that most people that are in the real estate business laugh at that shit. I think, I think the prospects laugh at it. I think the people shopping for the homes. So that's, I just did this huge, like, what do you think, John? Do you think I'm like out to lunch, full of baloney, don't know what I'm talking about? 
No, not at all, Robert. But before we go for our break, um, I just want to comment about, which is true, a lot of people, I suppose it depends on where the market is at the moment. A lot of people, they do give themselves their home to either a relative or to a friend. And I would be totally the opposite because um, doing employing a, a, re, a relative to sell your home initially might seem a good idea if it all pans out. Um, but if it doesn't, um, you're in a really tricky situation. And it's the same if you employed uh, a reasonably close friend. It's great if you know you want to be supportive. You want to that person, you know, you want to be generous. But if it doesn't pan out very well, you're going to lose a friend. Um, and business partnerships are totally different. I think a good business partnership can be very beneficial, but it could also be a nightmare. Um, but it's it's a totally different thing employing a relative or a friend because I, I think I would be reluctant to do it, actually, based on experience. I would be happier just choosing somebody that I think is effective, that knows what they were doing. Um, because if it doesn't pan out, I'm going to have to get somebody else. And that's tricky if it's a relative or friend. I don't disagree with anything you're saying, but John, why don't you take us to break and we'll, we'll be back. But we're, I do have to tell you and everybody else listening to the show tonight that I only have the 30 minutes allotted for the show. Yeah. So that's probably 10 more minutes after we come back. From break. Right. right. That's great. We're going for our breaks, folks. We'll be back in a few moments. We're coming back, folks. We've had a big dive about is traditional real estate marketing dying or is dead? Uh, um, Robert said some great thoughts. We're going to go back into it. So, Robert, on we go. So what's your next thought about this fantastic subject? Well, so so I do want to clarify since we have a little bit of extra time and like my original video that I did on this, John, was 23 minutes and 21 seconds. Okay. And so we're already 20 minutes into this one. And I really kind of said what I wanted to say about the distinction between the two. But having said that, I do want to I do want to embellish so that people can get a full scope of what traditional real estate marketing used to look like. Bus benches, geographic farming. There's little elements here and there of traditional real estate marketing, traditional real estate branding that still work. Geographic farming, as far as I know, has worked about the same yeah. like five years ago, 10 years ago. And, and what that looks like so that everybody knows, you've got to spend five or six years building up a reputation with the audience that you're sending these postcards to. There's no trackability, nothing like digital. You're not, you don't know if you're getting a visit or somebody's looked at your card a hundred times or thrown away a hundred times. You, you don't know until the phone call comes in. And so geographic farming is marketing in the dark is what I like to call it. And so you don't know for sure if you're establishing your brand or not, which is probably why it's one of the least popular types of marketing that there is. But it also seems to be pretty consistent from what I can gather from the people that I've talked to about it. So there's that. There's radio, which still is a thing that I've heard you know, agents do. Jade Mills still advertises in the back of the Opera Digest. So places that she feels that really high net worth individuals spend their time, she still advertises directly and in print and does full page, you know, the, the, the advertisements I've seen from her are full bios of, of her accomplishments as a real estate agent, along with a phone number to say, would you like to have a consultation? But that's it. Like full on, this is who I am. This is, and, and she sponsors a lot of different stuff, a lot of the arts. So she is a very prolific uh, human. If you're enjoying like the stage or theater or opera, or, that's where I've seen Joyce or Jade a lot. So those are traditional forms of marketing. 
I feel like what that does for you is it gets people, somebody to pick up their phone when they're reading the magazine and, and Google you. That's what I, that's because that's what I did. I watched a couple other people do the same thing. So likely Jade Mills is, is in conjunction with this advertising, is getting a lot of direct traffic back to her websites. That's how it's going to be identified. And now people are really starting to say, let's do the deep dive. Do I think anybody's calling her off the back of those like opera magazines? No, I really don't. Do you have an opinion about that, John? I don't think... I think it's a branding exercise, and like all branding exercises, it's hard to measure. Fair enough. And my my supposition here, one of the suppositions I'm going to make, is, ladies and gentlemen, given the choice, all the the branding that we used to do back in the day was branding in the dark. We didn't know how many people watched our television. We were told by the Nielsen people, you're going to be in 7 million households. Did we ever know for sure? No, we really didn't. What I love about digital and the reason I am a digital marketer, it's all trackable. If I spend $1,000 online, I get to see at least did those people go anywhere? Did I get an impression? I may not get calls, but at least I know what happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So one of the reasons I think that that real estate marketing is legitimately slowly dying is as a newer generation takes up the mantle, they're realizing some of these elements that I'm talking to you about, John, they're realizing that marketing in the dark is a little harder to quantify your dollar spent. You just don't know if they're working for you or not. That's the same problem that a lot of people have had. So when you start being faced with two different types of marketing, one that has a big buzz like digital, Plus, it's trackable, like digital. I feel like traditional is becoming a smaller and smaller bucket, and it's going to continue to be that way until it becomes a hundred percent niche. What do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I just think it's a really fascinating industry because all all the data that um, seems to some level legitimate is the appalling inability of most agents to follow to keeping content contact with their customer base to regularly ha continue any kind of relationship you know I, I can't remember off my head what the figure is that most people selling a house don't utilize the same agent obviously that that's down to the between five and seven years before somebody buys or sells their house again um but you but the kind of total lack of follow through and keeping any kind of relationship going which is easy to, to say harder to do um but some attempt and also a lot of people and this can be down to totally unrealistic expectations but it does also see that a lot of people's actual experience of their real estate professional, that a lot of them don't have a great experience, basically. Um, so I think there are some fundamental problems. But if if you can develop the sales skills, the service skills, and the internal processes, um, it's going to reap rewards, you know, uh, around having those reviews, having that kind of relationship and reputation that I think you've expressed so well in the first half and in the second half, Robert. Well, I think th I think we're 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 in accord. So for those of you listening to the show, listen, we could just keep going on and on and on about yeah. traditional branding. So so here's what my overall 10,000 foot view probably not going to change. Traditional branding used to be enough to get you a call on a deal. It really did. See your mm -hmm. you know, your your picture on the Coke can or bus bench enough times somebody might call you and be ready to do a deal. I really think that 98% of the business uh, that, that's out there has gone away from that. 
what you should expect is that they're going to go to someplace else and research you. Maybe they Google your name. Maybe they go to a website. Maybe they – so the close for me, if anybody was going to say, well, Robert, how would you do traditional branding? I'd say I'd send them someplace digital, uh, Zillow profile at worst, uh, my own website at best, and maybe probably very specifically my about page or landing page designed to tell a story and try to make a connection the very minute they visited that space. Like that's what I would do. And then once that was established, I'd send them someplace else in the site or then I would go for my my call to action, such as are you ready to, you know, have a consultation or, ha you know, carry on the discussion? Go down to the bottom of the website, use my calendar link. That's how I would do it. Yeah, I, I think I think there's just a misconception. I, I think obviously you're in the content um, area of <laughs> providing great educational content that you, with your clients and your team, you produce really quality content for their websites um, and attract people to the website through orga organic search. The, the thing with Duck Mail, right, we kind of focus on paid um, Facebook, Google, on WordPress with our CRM and our email and text drip campaigns. But um, what a lot of people I feel don't understand is that even if you're utilizing paid advertising to drive traffic to that website, they're, if they're really serious, they're going to look over that website. You know, they're going to have a good look over the website that they've been driven to by paid advertising. And you've got to have all the thing. You've got to have reviews. You've got to have video. You've got to have a message that resonates with the audience. I think just driving them to landing page, you, you're going to, yes, get them hopefully get their email or their phone number and you'll be able to make a call. But um, I also think a lot, I think you also need some some content, some branding and and some materials on, on your website, even if you're mostly using paid traffic. I, I think the most effective is a hybrid but um, for various reasons, a lot of agents can't. Um, but that's my that's my big picture of the situation, in a way. I'm, but hopefully, I'm not waffling, Robert. Well, well said as usual. A little bit, but but that's I, we both waffle. So if people have made it this far into the show. They know that. Uh, John, I must go. So why don't yes, you sign up? I'll, I'll wrap it up. Sign up. Sign yes, up. sure. Yeah, sure, Robert. So, what, Robert, what's the best way for people to find out more about you, your thoughts and your insights, Robert? So if anybody is interested in learning more about me or, or the company that I founded, go to inboundrem.com. Okay, just inboundrem.com. Look at the services page or the about page. Either way, you'll learn a lot about me and what we do. That's great. And if you want to learn more about MailRite and how we give you the power of real geeks, but the branding ability that can you and ownership that you can only get from WordPress, go over to mail-right.com. We'll be back next week with a great either a guest interview or another great topic. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Bye.